Hello Egyptology lovers, so now the uh, the necklace pectoral is complete. Uh, it's been lasered on the piece, so the necklace is pretty much firm now. Uh, you can raise it up so you could see like that. So there it is, and I'll show you what it looks like when it's worn on me. But for now, let me go ahead and explain what uh, the completion is all about. So the piece is replicates as much as possible the pectorals that the ancient Egyptians had done in the previous past. Uh, in the centuries ago. So in their culture, they would basically create pectorals like this with imagery and iconography. Like they had so many in their temples, their papyrus, their books, their daily lives. They always, everything was imagery for them. And we know that because we still have records of today. But let me explain. The jewelry now is basically authentic. It's silver, sterling silver, and it has inlays. There's approximately 203 pieces in the entire piece that I basically cut out over here. Now, everything is pretty much the same type of stone, but overlapping, I mean, uh, interchanging itself. So we have lapis for blue, carnelian for red, and we have a gate for green. Now, in some places I use, for example, over here, feldspar, which is one of the main stones of the ancient Egyptians. So feldspar, carnelian, and lapis and turquoise were, were the big ones that they used. I used a little bit of an agate over here and a mother of pearl. I've also used some seashells for the white for the wings, and you can see here for the bread loaf, and a simple little tiger eye right over here as well. So looking at the piece now, I basically, what you do is I've designed the piece by using a technique called filigree. You create the wire work first, and then you take a silver plate, a flat plate, as thin as you like, and then you basically solder the entire piece on there. And then where the negatives are, the, the clear area is, you can see here, you use a saw, a jewelry saw, and you cut it around, and then you eventually clean it with a file. And that's it. That's pretty much it what you do. And then you just have to really work on detail, make sure it's clean. Now the hard part starts, even though that's a bit of a process. Now begins the cutting of each individual stone. It's an individual space. So you can see each one has to fit in accordance to its spot. Uh, so that takes a little bit of patience and time. And a lot of the Egyptians too couldn't cut pieces all entirely in one shape. They might break or chip or other things which happened to me. So sometimes they did them in, in pieces or they had no choice. So for example, you can see in the body, this broken half. So I had to glue them together. Some parts of the leg here were about two pieces. Here you have four pieces. So it's really, that's how it works. And then you begin to enter the phase of the jewelry here on the side where you see these little teeny pieces that fit in these little slots to create that theme that they had in their uh, designs. So this is a motif that they had. Now over here for the necklace, what you have is, um, these are called teardrops. And this is lapis, of course, blue, and then the carnelian for red for the beads, and then of course the teardrop once again for turquoise, and it repeats with silver beads in the center. This is goes all the way around. And over here, I put a black onyx stone in order to indicate the center. And then it continues back around again, and then it flips over. And then I pass that through into a hole that we cut on the very top of the piece over here. And then from there, we basically just soldered it or used laser welding so to get that precise clean cut. Now, once the Egyptians designed something like this, they would do the same thing on the very back. So I'll flip the back for you. And now the back, which now I used a, a mechanical drill, they used hand chisels. They'd carved the same design from the front to the back. So you could see everything's pretty much replicated. And they'd have these little crisscrossing lines and circular motions, and pretty much everything is a line and a design to be able to replicate the front. And it's pretty much the same thing as you see in the front, but I've done it in the back. And, and that's it, this is the simplicity of the back. It's just really taking your time and designing the way they did as well. So in this video, what I really wanted to do is discuss the iconography of the piece. Now, that's something people have been asking me about, so I'll explain to you what it is. This piece is basically represented within a shrine frame, and now this is what we call it. So this is a shrine from the top over here. It's like a canopy. It comes down here and here and here and indicates that this is a shrine. Now, within that shrine, which is considered very holy in the sacred place of the pharaoh and the gods, what you have is a blue lapis for sky. Now, lapis is a very precious stone, which is not found in Egypt, but in Afghanistan, it was imported. This stone actually replicates the night sky because lapis has that dark, black, bluish kind of color. But in each stone, you have these pyrite steel metals inside them, and that creates the, the twinkling effect of stars. So that's a natural occurrence in lapis, a very good quality lapis as well. So this is the word pet for sky. And then down here, I'll just get to the, uh, the, the basic stuff and then we'll go from there. Down here, we have a water right over here. 
So this is basically considered the Nile. I've, it's a twisted rope called torsad. You take a single strand of silver rope or gold, whatever metal, fold it in half and then twist it. And then you get this kind of like twisted effect over here. And then from here, what you do after that is kind of, you can see where I've soldered it on. So this represents the water. Of course, you can see that this is a boat. This is called the Mesket boat. So uh, the Medjet boat. So the Medjet boat is the boat that actually traverses the sky. And this is when Ra basically uh, enters into the underworld. But here, Ra is rising. So this is the Mesket boat, the night park. So he is rising. So in essence, you have the boat itself. You have the two oars, and oars are very important. And they were, you can find oars in the tomb of Tutankhamun by his tomb, uh, where he basically, oars are to indicate that when you travel on the waters of the afterlife, you have oars to help you to guide yourself instead of just letting the current drag you. And within this image right over here, you have also uh, what I, uh, the iconography of the hill. Now, before I continue, let me continue about the boat. So the boat, the color here is green. So the marshes of the water, which were black and a bit green of the Nile. So this represents the green color. It's very important. And the blue is much of the sky. So it, it, was, it did float in the sky, the boat, but also it traveled on the water. So it has double meaning. It has this, that it's a boat of the sky and that it's the boat of the water as well. Now, over here, you have a stand. Now, this, usually it had the stand, but didn't have the shen on there. I included that in there for the iconography. And the shen symbol is a cartouche, which you all know has the pharaoh's names when it's elongated. But in its simplicity, shen is actually considered a circular infinity symbol, which means that it's a cyclical life. That means anytime you put your name inside a shen or cartouche, that means you're asking your life to be rejuvenated and reborn in a cycle without dying. So there's a symbology of that. Now you have over here another stand, and I've included these as well. You don't find these on the boat, but I've included it. You have a bread loaf, and the bread loaf represents food, offering. So food, which means to give, is also verb to give. And this was very important, like we do with our basically Christian, Judeo, and um, Muslim traditions of breaking bread, which is an offering of peace or an offering of food. So it's basically bread, but then you have the ant for life. Now you have bread and an ant for life, which represents life itself. But this means now is a sentence or a phrase I've created. So it says to give life. So I'm basically telling you that upon this boat, Kepri, which is the scarab beetle representation of Ra, gives life on this boat and he is eternal. And upon his eternity, there is a boat. He is traveling with this. Now, when he rises in the Eastern horizon, this is the horizon. This is a mountain. So the mountain from which the sun rises, this is known as the Achet. I mean the Ach. So Ach means that it's rise, it's it's the symbol of basically a hill, a rolling hill. You can see the, the two mountain sides, and then the sun, which rises from underneath. Now, as he, this is the old sun, it's smaller than the big sun. So the sun is the sun from the previous day. As he rises upon it, he sheds it back, and then he uses the bigger sun to come forward. And he is the, basically has dominion over the sun, and over here you have the moon, the crescent moon. And so he is basically carrying both the day and the night with him as well. Now, Kepri's body is covered in blue lapis, much like the sky. So this is important because it's a representation of also the celestial sky in which he travels. So Kepri is a scarab beetle. This is a, this is a type of insect in which would roll a, dung, a ball of dung on the land for very long distances. And within the dung ball or the, uh, the poop ball, they would call it, I guess, is is basically its eggs that it's laid in. And he was trying to find a spot to bury the dung beetle to bury the dung ball so that when it finally has completed its job, it dies. And within the dung, the beetles, the little baby beetles, uh, beetle eggs open up and they become, once they come out, they begin to eat the dung around them as their food. And then from there, they come alive. So the cycle continues again. They come out, they emerge, and they continue the process as well of doing the same thing. Basically breeding, laying the eggs inside a dung ball, rolling it somewhere down to a area, burying it on the ground, dying, and then repeating the process. So Kepri rises with his wings, meaning like a bird, he rises as well, which of course the white for the wings, they're rising up into the sky. And Kepri's body represents the sky as well, and since the blue lapis, like the night sky of Pet. And as he rises, he basically brings the day and the night with him as well. Now, the final iconography in the piece here is you have these two flowers. Now, flowers are very important to ancient Egypt, especially the lotus flower and the lily flower. Both these type of flowers emerge out of the water. And when they emerge, especially a lotus, 
uh, a lotus flower, what it does is in the daytime, it opens up and in the nighttime, it closes. And so it represented the same thing as the actual uh, beetle of rejuvenation and the cycle, much like the Shen, the rejuvenation and the cycle of closing and opening, closing and opening. So it's the constant cycle of birth and rebirth. So very important to the Egyptians. They included the flowers in their jewelry and in all their pict iconography pictures as well. Now, of course, the, the, the papyrus plant. Now, the papyrus plant was also, I'm sorry, the lotus flower, excuse me. The lotus flower did the same thing. It would open up and close, open up and close. Oh, this is this is a blooming one, just as this one is blooming as well. So they would do the same thing: open in the night and close in the, uh, clo close in the night and open up in the day. And that's the jewelry representation right here. So if you read this as a person in ancient Egypt, seeing this around the pharaoh or the person in which uh, the royalty is carrying it, they're basically saying that Kepri, who travels in his night bark, emerges from the horizon in into the day and carrying with him the sun of the, the following day. And upon that, he is rejuvenated with both the lily and the lotus flower. And then he is cyclical and eternal. And then from there, his bringing of day brings life to everyone in the land. So there's basically the iconography and representation of the jewelry. So now you understand the importance of doing pictorials for ancient Egyptians and what their significance. So there's the entire piece once again. What I'm really going to do with this piece, I haven't decided, but my biggest, I'm leaning more towards donating it to a museum, donating it to a museum where they can display it for other people to see it and hopefully be inspired like I did when I saw a pictorial piece at the British Museum and I wanted to make my own. So there you go. I'll show you what it looks like on me as well so you can see how it's worn. All right, so now I'm gonna explain how this type of piece is made. So. What you need to do is, this is all in silver. What you need to do first, this is called filigree work, is you need to make the design. So you pick up a design and what you have to do is all these little pieces here, you see them, the wings, the legs, uh, this uh, this mountain here, the boat, the line, not the, not the flat part, not the flat part, the surface here, but actually the pieces, you could see them, they're elevated. This is filigree. This is what you have to design first and solder. So you could see you make these pieces, you twist them into their shapes, and you solder them together like that. You see they're all soldered. Even the top now is solid. You can see where the solder is right there. And you can see that comes all the way down here. And you basically have to work this and solder it all. Once you've soldered the filigree and you've twisted the wire, the next step now is to take a flat plate. As you can see, if I flip this over, you have a flat plate. This was actually a solid piece. I simply, once it's soldered on, so you put the plate, you put the filigree over it, and then you start the process of soldering it. You just put the liquid where you want and the pieces will stick together. You have to go methodically one by one and just let the, let the silver or gold, if you're working with gold, kind of melt into the spaces. And now it locks down and it's solidified. Once you do that, then you poke holes into the plate and you start the process of carving out the, the, the negative space right around here. So you have to carve all that out from all the way around. And you can see now you have the effect of this on the back. Uh, you can see where the pieces were soldered over here, sometimes together, uh, where the kind of the silver just melted off a little bit from the solder, but that's how it is. And then I give it a quick polish. Uh, uh, kind of a burnish and then a polish and then that's pretty much it. So that's the simple approach. Now over here, this is called a torsad. This is, represents the water. I could have done a wave like the standard N for the letter N for the water, but instead I took two wires, twisted them together and made what we call a torsad. And then you could see I soldered them at certain spots together and on the boat and then basically over here as well. So that is the completion of this piece. And then you trim off the any excess that you have, any sharp edges, uh, you clean off little areas around the corners here. You can see where this has got soldered as well. And the same over here. And that's it. Really, there's nothing much more to it. It's just a long, arduous, tedious process filigree. It's not something where you just kind of solder two things together, but you have to do several type of things at the same time. Uh, so yeah, so that's it. And then what you do after that is you basically start putting in the stones, uh, which you see is over here. All right, that was the stones. You cut them out accordingly, then you have to take them back out again. Now, generally, if you're working in gold or silver and you decided on your metal and you've carved the back space of your piece, then you do that first. And then when you start putting in your pieces, you glue them as you go along and then you give it a polish after. That's faster, but unfortunately, I went the other way around. This took eight years 
to kind of do on and off here and there, put it away, brought it back, that now I have to do this in plated gold and then put the pieces back in. So that's the, uh, the step for me to do right after that. So stay tuned for that piece. And we're gonna work on carving the back of this here. So I'll show you the back. The same design using this Dremel tool. And we're gonna make the same design. We're gonna draw it in first with a marker so we know we have our lines and then we're gonna do the same after. All right, so stay tuned for that. Hello Egyptology lovers, so I'm going to show you how I work these processes, a very long arduous process. So each stone is carved, I take things like, you know, this is seashell that was a bead, I carve it out and then I make that, but it takes time because I have to use my foot pedal, which is below me, and grind out these stones slowly like that. And then once that's grinded down, then I can put it in the position where I had it before like this like that you see and it fits perfectly right there and that's how I work the jewelry and this is a process that's going to be basically for the entire piece making it this way so let's hope for the best and finish it up maybe by in a couple of weeks maybe a week guys so one side of the wing is complete I'll show it to you in the sun how nice it illuminates in there so it's one side of the wing is complete and I'm gonna work on the next side and finish that up as well Alrighty, so uh, just continuing uh, update here so all I, uh, the two wings are done uh, com both complete I just have to left to do the moon for the day and that's it for the day and start back tomorrow buddy so this is the end of the day for this particular piece I'm gonna work on day two tomorrow I'm gonna show you the wings are done and the moon is done I'm gonna show you how delicate this moon is I have to take it out with the needle it's so delicate it's almost like like, look at that. It's like a hair. Almost like a toothpick. When you put it, I had to carve it very delicately. When, when I put it back, it falls right in place. That's how delicate you have to be. Look, almost the size of a needle. So it took a lot of work to put together, but that's uh, that's day one here, and we're going to work on day two tomorrow. All right, everybody, so today is day two. Uh, I already have the pieces ready to cut out for the rest of the scarab body, so I'll get to that, and we'll go. Uh, I'll show you the end of the process. for today everything has been placed and cut properly in position i'm very happy tomorrow we're going to work on the lower part of the boat here the, the bark the book of the boat of the day so uh, that'll be for tomorrow so there you go the completion of the entire scarab with wings and body and there you go till tomorrow welcome back egyptology lovers so today we're working on day three we're doing this stones up here finishing up the rows there's about nine pieces this is known as feldspar so these are natural occurring stones that the egyptians used uh, it's basically another color that they use and I'm basically cutting it up and grinding them down like I do before They're all gonna go in position over here like I did with this one right there. So that's it So this is feldspar or green feldspar and there's a hieroglyph for this as well So um, the feldspar didn't work very well because the rock was too brittle So it broke every time I try to get too thin So in the end I just did basically put the feldspar here for the surmount where we have the uh, the Shen symbol and that's pretty much it for the day so i'll just try to start back tomorrow by completing the lower part and then i'll do this another time so till tomorrow everybody so today we're going to do day four i skipped that yesterday i was a little tired but we're going to do the flowers we're going to do lotus and the lily so i'm going to use the blues for the lily and the white in the center and the green will cover the plant itself the same over here and it's going to be white with green so this will be our project for today uh today's uh, fourth day is complete uh, the lotus flower the head the blooming with the white and the green i'll do the stem tomorrow and the lily with the white that was quite difficult the center with the white there but the colors as well and that that's pretty much difficult i'll work on the stem tomorrow hello egyptology lovers so today we're going to be working on the stem for both the flowers and then eventually working on the uh, platform here plus the bread loaf and that should finish it off for the day if i do quickly enough i'll work a little bit on the boat as well hey guys so this is the end of day four for me right now so you could see here that uh, I did the green, but there's a little piece here that flew off. I'll deal with that later. 
Uh, I also did the bread loaf with this uh, tiger eye for this over here and uh, just kind of carved these down but I'll work on this stem over here too. Hey everybody so we're done for the day. Uh, I'm basically just showing you that I completed some of the most of the stems. There's just a little bit left. I'll deal with that tomorrow. I uh, did the bread loaf with the uh, tiger eye over here and that's pretty much it. It was a busy day. These pieces kind of flew off. Uh, but yeah, so we'll come back tomorrow and try it again. Buddy, so we're gonna finish up day six today. I got some agate stones that I found uh, in a store. So really, really nice stones that cut really easily. I got a, uh, basically a Dremel cutter and I'll cut right through the stone so I can get those nice sizes there without having to grab the whole stone. So we'll do the agate and uh, we'll finish up some pieces today. Uh, pretty much all I did was this today. Apparently I was just cutting them all in half and I realized most of the strand was plastic. So it's just plastic covered with ink. Well, some of them were real. so the china product that just mixed uh, a lot of fake ones with good ones so what are you gonna do technology lovers so today it's quite rainy but that's okay today i'm gonna work on the very top area and finish this up today uh, if i have enough time i'll try to work maybe the bottom or just actually just level these guys down because they're a little too high so that's for today for day seven technology lovers so today i'm complete for day seven i basically did the gate with the top area for the shrine is complete i did, did the gate for the bottom of the boat and I finally also flattened out the Lapis Sky pet here. So that's done for today. And tomorrow we'll start with something different and try to finish up the piece. Hello, everybody. So today is day eight for the Scarab. So I'm going to try to just finish up the uh, the green over here. It's quite hard to do, but I'll try to do that stem and that'll be the end of the day. And maybe if I have more time, I'll file down these guys over here, make them nice and straight. So that's for today. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So the centerpieces are all done. The stem is complete. I grinded down the carnelian here around the frame, but now I got to fill them up a little bit because they were too short uh, the next time I start doing it. So they're all full. And after that, yeah, we'll go from there, but this is done the center. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So today we're going to be working on for day nine is the uh, surrounding area, the carnelian. Make sure it fits properly like this one I just did right now. So I have to cut a piece out so it fits within it. So now it looks full. I'm going to do that for the ones that are missing. So I've set up some of the pieces. So yeah, that's for today. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So day nine is complete. I was able to do this one side here. You can see I filled them up there to have the separators. This side is filled up. This is filed down. That was filled up, but I still have to do three down here and I'll have to do another three over here. So that's for next time. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So today we're continuing the uh, carnelian carving. So I did those yesterday and now I'm going to do two over here and I'm going to do three over here. Once that's done, the outer rim is done and all I have to do now is start working on the little pieces on all the way around. All right. So that's today for day 10. Hey everybody, so everything is done here. The carnelian, the carnelian has been carved out and positioned for all of them. All that's left now is to fill out these little sections over here. We're going to stick with the same theme over here with, blue, with red, blue, and green and blue. So that's what we're going to do next. All right, everybody, so today we're doing day 11. So we're working the outside now, like I told before. You can see I already put a nice lapis in there, so you see how it fits. So I'm going to do that all the way around here, but not all today. Maybe just kind of work this area here first. We'll see how far we get. So that's today. Carving down the stone so I can get it flat, so I can get it for the little pieces. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So today is I'm going to end the day 10 uh, for today uh, because what's going to happen is I just simply prepared the pieces for tomorrow. So all of them are going to be cut teeny little ones can take some time but that's what it's going to be so that's tomorrow's day 11. hello egyptology lovers so today we're just going to discuss the starting and completion so today i started working on the sides you can see i've filled them out and i did the other side as well they are filled out and by tomorrow i should be done and fill out here and then the piece is complete so until tomorrow egyptology lovers today is day 12 hopefully the last day for this carving and this will be basically uh doing the bottom part the little guys and we'll finish that up today and that'll be the end of the piece and the completion. We'll move on to something else. Hey everyone, so we're gonna show you here that we're almost done. We have about six pieces, seven pieces to finish here for the gate bottom and the piece is complete. So uh, stay tuned for that. Hey Egyptology lovers, so here it is. Thank you for tuning in and watching me, my development. So the piece is complete. Uh, I've added everything at the bottom here. Everything's been put on the side. So the jewelry is finished. Uh, thank you very much for you guys watching this video. I'm just going to show you a close-up here. You can see how it's all in there. It didn't take very long. I was surprised. It just took a lot of patience and preparation, but that's about it. 
But, see, but yes, the entire piece is complete. I'm very happy for that. So the next step is to carve on the back the same design, but on the back of the silver. And then we're gonna, add, we're gonna glue all these pieces together onto the plate. That will be the final step. And then I'll work on the necklace, which will attach to the actual uh, pectoral. So that will be the final stage uh, going from there. So thank you very much everybody for watching. This is the completion of the piece after eight years. So I'm very happy and thank you for watching guys show you my workstation so this is what i was working with the stones more stones and my uh, hammer and kit over here so this is how i was working to finish the piece so you see hey Egyptology lovers so i'm just going to show you the completion of this pectoral so this is made out of silver so all the pieces have been inlaid so this is a filigree style work where you would basically uh, make the actual frame first as you can see here, and you solder it all in the frames, uh, the different frames that you see that is surrounded with uh, jewelry pieces. And then you lay down a flat plate and you solder it all together. And then from there, you carve it out with a saw, a hand saw, a miniature one for jewelry. And then you have all this clear, empty, negative space. From there, you begin the long, arduous process like the Egyptians did to carve each individual stone uh, which you see here into its appropriate spot. And this is what I've done over here. You could see the lapis, the carnelian, the green uh, agates over here and here, the turquoise, uh, the white is seashell, uh, carnelian in the center over here. You have some turquoise as well, as I mentioned before. And you pretty much have it all going around here in the same theme into these little miniature slots. So this is the completion of the actual uh, pectoral jewelry. Now I'm going to go through the explanation of how to make this again, but what I'm going to do is remove the pieces, set them down somewhere because I need to do another process here, which is basically engrave the same design on the front, on the back, using a Dremel tool uh, with a diamond tip point in order to create the effect of the same they did the Egyptians on the back of their jewelry. So it's going to be a replica of the back and that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then after that, we're going to glue each individual piece in its proper position once again. So that will be the next uh, step for this piece. So stay tuned for that process, and then I'll work on the necklace afterwards. All right, everybody. So you can see here how I flipped the piece over. So this is going to get engraved on the back with this tool. It's going to create the same design on the front on the back over here. Now I'm going to remove this piece. I'm going to show you how some of the pieces came out, but some didn't. As you can see here, some of them come out. Some of them I did not. So I'm going to have to remove those pieces individually, slowly, one by one. That's the way to do it. But we have to keep the pattern the same so we don't lose track of it. So yeah, that's the next step here. So let's do that. All right, everyone. So I want to show you here now that now I flipped it over. There was a bit of a mess up, but what are you going to do? I'll fix it when I do it. But when you turn it over now, you can see the pieces are laying right there on their backs. And that's the piece right over here. And that's what we're going to now get uh, working on. All right, so now that we have this, we're going to carve the same design on the back of this over here using this tool and then from there we'll start the process of putting the pieces together to make this one right here putting them back with glue so that's what we're going to do after that welcome back egyptology lovers so i've done all the tracing for the back of the piece to replicate the front with a bit of out of touch of design from the ancient egyptian jewelry that i've seen online so here you can see how i've kind of started doing the uh, the carving into it. So there you go. And let's do it in stages and see what happens. working the back side of the piece, trying to make it look as much as possible as the front side. All right, so we're almost complete here with the back of the uh, pectoral. All I have to do is the wing side here, as you can see, engraved. It's gonna be um, the last few wings here, it's gonna be engraved, and we'll see if we'll do something with that. Hey, Egyptology lovers. So we are completely done engraving the back here, the design. Uh, which fits the same design in the front. So you could see a little bit the engraving of the wings in the back. So that's done for this. All right, guys. So what we do, we're going to do next now is we're going to use this call. This is a paste. This is for uh, polishing. 
we rotate that on there and then we give it a polish and I already did that so you could see I've polished it around you could see it's shining a little bit more I want it to look like it's shining it doesn't have to be perfect so there you go hello Egyptology lovers so today we're gonna do uh, the transferring over of the pieces again to the actual piece we're gonna use a cement bond right over here and that's gonna help us bond it together to the silver so the pieces will bond over here Hey everybody, so uh, basically today I'm gluing all the pieces. You can see uh, pretty much all the pieces are glued so far. All I have to do now is the outside area to glue everything and then we'll work on the chain. So stay tuned for that. Hey everyone, so I'm pretty much glued everything now except the little guys here, which are pretty much scattered around, unfortunately. So now I gotta figure out where they all go. Oh well, what are you gonna do? Uh, that'll, that'll be the last thing to do, so and that'll be it. Hey, Egyptology lovers, great news. The piece is complete. Everything is glued. Everything's been positioned right on its place. So I'm very happy that the piece is done. Uh, eight years later, I guess, but there you go. All done. We're gonna work on the next step I'll do in the video. All right, everyone. So the next step now is to create the necklace which goes with it. Here are the beads that go with it. And uh, this is basically the, uh, the silver. Uh, that's going to create the string and we're going to attach that around. I'll show you once it's all set up with the string. So we'll go from there. All right, everybody. So now we're going to bead the string. So it's pretty much just making sure that I take, uh, this is going to pass through the other end over here. Okay. That's what it's going to do, but I'm going to bend this so it doesn't come back out. So what we do is just give it a little bit of a bend like that. And that's it. That's all you need. And then just making sure the bead doesn't come back down through it again. And then we can cut it and adjust it, but I'm going to bead the string and then we'll go from there. All right, now everyone, so we're going to bead the, the string. We're going to go in a sequence. That's the sequence we're going to follow. The lapis, then the bead, then a carnelian, then silver, then turquoise, then uh, the teardrops, that's what they're called, turquoise, bead, 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 and then repeats the same as that one over there. So that's how we're going to operate. And then now let me just do it all, and I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so you can see the sequence here that, it's, uh, that you see that it's developing. And uh, I'll get back to you guys, but I just want to show you that's the sequence we're looking for. All right, everyone, now that the pictorial is complete, I've completed the chain. You can see the sequence, uh, the way it moves from lapis to turquoise and all the way around. And to center it, I put an onyx bead 
and it goes all the way around. Now we're going to attach it to this and then uh, hopefully uh, complete it. All right, so now that the, everything is complete, I'm showing you how it's going to connect. It's going to go in that way, and then we're going to basically laser it onto there. See how it fits in that hole right there? You can see the line, and we'll do the same on the other side, and then the chain is complete, and that's it. And I'll show you guys that after.